right, good morning. I'm sitting here in our downtown Dallas Inc. world headquarters at the top of Bank of America Plaza. I am the only one up here in the office today as it has been for many of us recently. Uh, my name is Courtney Garrett. I'm the president and CEO of Downtown Dallas Inc. And I just wanna start this morning by thanking all of you for spending this time with us. About half of you joined us for our kickoff event, which was a general state of the market overview. And again, today we have over 200 registered folks joining us uh, for this great conversation with Ray Washburn, which we'll get to in just a minute. A couple of important housekeeping items as we get used to these virtual forums. One, this program is being recorded and we will make the recording available to you after the event. It will be sent to you via email and will also be posted on our YouTube page. So be sure if you'd like others to see this conversation and learn a little bit more that you share the video once it's posted. We also will be entertaining questions at the end as time allows. Please, anytime throughout the broadcast, type your questions into the Q&A section. Shalissa Perry, our Chief Marketing Officer, will be facilitating those questions uh, toward, the, toward the end of the program. So we look forward to hearing from all of you as well. Now to get us started, I want to start by really talking about the change that we've all experienced. We know that the entire world has changed in such a short amount of time in ways that none of us could have ever imagined. And the center of our city, our downtown, has really been at the epicenter of this shift. And we know the livelihood and the success of our entire city rests on the center of it, its heart, its core of downtown. Downtown is the economic and the social center of Dallas. We're the largest tax base. We're the largest employer. We have the fastest growing residential population in the city, and we're the hub of our public transportation system. Downtown is that place where all of Dallas comes together. So how we recover and how we move forward is imperative to all of Dallas. Since March, DDI, we've been focused quite a bit on our field operations and ensuring that we're providing all of you with accurate real-time information that is absolutely imperative to how we live and how we do business in downtown. Our downtown safety patrol and our clean team are still available to you seven days a week. You can reach them through our See, Say, Now app, which is available for download on any platform, or you can reach us simply by picking up the phone and calling our dispatch center. You can find that information on our website at downtowndallas.com. Our homeless outreach program has resumed its operations, so look for our coordinators out in the field in purple shirts. <clears throat> And just on June 1st, we launched a storefront restoration program that so far has provided over $80,000 in grants to our downtown small restaurant and merchant businesses. We've also launched a business continuity program to support all of our sectors, our merchants, our small and medium businesses, our anchor corporations, our property owners, hospitality partners, and our residents. We're monitoring local, state, and national legislation and we have affirmed our commitment to building a downtown for all, a downtown that will double down on its goals for equity and inclusivity. So the goal of this series is to really take an in-depth look at all of the market sectors in downtown. We're gonna look at COVID market impacts, recovery strategies, and how we collectively ensure that future growth and equitable advancement remain balanced. $4 billion of development continues to move forward in downtown. So we want to talk about why and we want to talk about how. And there's no better way to do that than by talking to those that have skin in the game. So it's my pleasure to be here this morning on our screen, to be sharing the screen with Ray Washburn. Those, Ray and those we'll be talking to throughout this series, they're invested. They're committed to moving downtown forward. They're responsible for projects that will be instrumental in stabilizing and growing our economy. These projects are creating jobs. They're delivering housing, retail, more entertainment, and more services to downtown. So over the course of the summer, we're going to be hearing from a lot of these folks like Ray, Sean Todd, Mike Hoke, 
Larry Daniels, Sarah Terry, John Zog, and so, so many more. And again, today though, we're talking to Ray. So we want to jump right in. This is about a 45 minute in total program. So we want to get right to it and hear from Ray, who frankly needs very little introduction. Those of you who are in commercial real estate know Ray very well. His local investments span from Highland Park to West Dallas, South Dallas, East Dallas, and now downtown. He's involved in restaurants, entertainment, multifamily office, you name it, but all with this incredibly unique perspective. Ray acquired the old Dallas Morning News site at 508 Young Street last year and has some really big plans, which we're all really looking forward to hearing. So without further ado, Ray, thank you for joining us this morning. Hope you're recording. Thank you for having me. So I have to ask, first off, because it's right there behind you, tell me about the painting. Before we go any further, tell everyone about the painting behind you. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'll hold my iPad up. This is a David Bates painting of the s and I don't know the best way I can do this, but it's an s and Oyster House back in about 1980. And David Bates, who's a very famous uh, Dallas artist, um, actually painted himself in the kitchen, which is hard to see here looking out. But those waiters, and you can tell that's kind of an s and look. Also over here, I'm like, so what a Dallas guy I am, Dallas Times Herald newsboy. That's a that's an old Dallas Times Herald box. But that whole bookshelf is filled with Dallas memorabilia and, and history. So anyway, it's a great painting. I bought it. It was painted in the early 80s. and was in the J.C. Penney collection. <clears throat> and when they started having some problems about 10 years ago, they liquidated their art collection and I had a big wall to fill, and I'm in the restaurant business, so it fit well. Yeah. <laughs> well, it makes a big, great backdrop and a good segue into where I want to start, which is just basically your story. You're a native Dallasite, and you have this really incredible story of building the career that you have now as an entrepreneur. So kind of walk us through the highlights of that from school to, um, I think, maybe carpet installer at one point in time. Yeah. Uh, it, to it was funny, Courtney, when you asked me that, you know, you're going to ask me that question. I, I reflected on it, and I'm from Dallas. I was born at Baylor Hospital. Um, I've kind of lived through the transformation of Dallas into the city that it is today. I was born in 1960, so to the Kennedy assassination, even though I was a child, you know, I had to live with that throughout the 1960s. But my kind of love for downtown started when I was about eight or nine years old. My mom would put me on the Dallas Transit System, which is the predecessor to DART, bus for a dime she got eight years old put me on a bus to go downtown dallas and my dad's office was at the old davis building which is now apartments and i'd ride the bus down by my past where the crescent is today and where the crescent is today used to be a bunch of car lots and people can't believe it, it was a bunch of used car lots and and a chevrolet dealership and i would pass that and end up dropping off at st paul and pacific and then i would wander around downtown really an eight or nine year old my mom was like oh, through Teiches, Sanger Harris, Nima Marcus, the old H.L. Green, I'd go in there and get a milkshake. It's now the Wilson building this day. It was an old little kind of a five and dime uh, store. And then wander around, have lunch with my dad. This was in the summertime. I'd do it once a week. And then I'd go to one main place, which at the time was a beehive of activity of retail. And they had a guy in a popcorn stand there called the Popcorn Man. I'd get a bag of popcorn. Then I'd walk over and walk through the big bank lobbies of First National Bank, Republic National Bank, Mercantile. And then my dad, I'd go see my dad at five o'clock and we'd ride the bus home together. So I really understood the street life of downtown Dallas. So as I grew, I ended up going to SMU and I worked for a real estate company downtown. And I noticed as they built these huge new towers, they really ripped the heart out of the life of downtown. You know, where the momentum places today, or which was the Mercantile Bank, New Bank, Comerica Bank now, you know, that was filled with some great retailers like Bolt Brothers. They had Dreyfus and Son. Incredible retailing, but it was very much on a pedestrian level. Same with, work. and as they tore all that stuff down and built these towers with no retail. I mean, I was a product of being a, loving the street life and being down there. And I always had that in me to want to come back to downtown Dallas and create that. And so all of a sudden the soul downtown was ripped out. I got out of SMU in 83. I was in Eric Dickerson's class. So I'm kind of a product of Dallas. It was booming, the SNLs, everything moved north. And downtown just shuttered at that time and really went into about a 20 to 30 year hibernation. But I knew the way that it had been and the way it could, that, that I missed. But 
as things went north, I got very involved in the SNL deal. I was young enough to participate, but not old enough to get in trouble. Because <laughs> I, I, I didn't kiss any paper. And so when things started blowing up, um, I was in my late 20s. Since I was able to go out and buy stuff, I bought most of the land in Las Colinas around Lake Caroline, you know, in front of Williams Square. I mm -hmm. bought a huge track out there. I bought about 70 acres of land that today is all developed into apartments and things. But that had been foreclosed on by the bank that took over Republic, which is called NCMB, which became Nations Bank, which became Bank America. NCMB, for those of you old enough to remember, is from North Carolina. It was North Carolina and National Bank. We all called it no cash for nobody because – they ended up foreclosing everybody out. But again, I was young enough that I was able to participate. So I, was, I started buying subdivisions, land. I started developing. I think Steve Brown wrote an article about me in 1989. They had three years previous, they had had 30,000 condos built in Dallas and apartments. We went four years without a single permit being pulled. He put me on the front page of the Dallas Morning News with, I built three units at Throckton Wharton in Herschel in 19, I think it was 1988, 89. I was the only permit pulled in the entire year for all of Dallas Fort Worth for apartments or condos, three units. And so um, anyway, I got that actually in a, framed up here behind me. And it looks like the way they took the picture, it looks like I'm building a 30 story building, but it was in, and I, one of the units was mine. So really I only built two spec units, but I kind of took that forward and started building more apartments and just kind of let it roll from there. When I was at SMU, I paid my way through SMU selling carpet to the freshmen and I had vending machines and a bunch of the apartment complexes over on University in Greenville and paid my way through school doing that. And when I got out of there, I knew Dallas was the city of Oz and this is the place where I wanted to be. So since then, you know, I built a lot of different businesses up and now I'm fortunate I own everything from the Highland Park Village in Dallas to Trinity West Shopping Center in West Dallas Projects at Singleton and Hampton I bought last year. And that was a uh, food desert over there. If, for those of you who don't know, it has no grocery stores or anything else. The, the Carnival grocery store in that center had closed. So I went and I wanted to do something for the area. And so we found a grocer, we cut him up, just basically gave him space to put in a 35,000 foot grocery store. And now that center is turned around. It's about a hundred thousand feet. And it's done extremely well for the neighborhood and it's done well for us. And so I've got that. I've got shopping centers in Illinois and Hampton and Depot Cliff. Um, I've got apartments in East Dallas. I've redone a bunch of apartments at Gaston Live Oak, you know, those 1950s apartments and redone them. And I, I'm just, I'm just a believer in Dallas. That was a long answer to your question. <laughs> so. No, no, no. It's a really good one because I want you to, to elaborate on that last thing you just said. I'm a believer in Dallas. Yeah. Why well, why, well, it's a city I can work in. I've lived here my whole life. I, I was on the Dow City Plan Commission when I was 24 years old. And so <clears throat> I, you know, from a very early age, I could see kind of how the machinery of the city worked, good or bad, but I, I personally could understand it. But you can get things done here. I mean, I can go to East Dallas. And we can buy an old apartment house and you can get through a permitting process and get something done. My friends in California or New York, Chicago, it takes them forever to get anything done. Here, I can make stuff, you know, happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, uh, when I did the deal in, in West Dallas, you know, I was able to call the city manager, get right in, say, this is what I want to do. I'm not looking for any city, you know, uh, tax money or anything like that. All I want is when we permit, just just make it to where we can get stuff done so we can move it along. And they, they were very accommodating on getting, making that happen. So I believe in Dallas because I think, you know, the transportation network here is great. I think the connectivity that I'd like to talk about more later is getting even greater. Um, like this morning I got up, rode my bike out to White, around White Rock. I'm um, a new Katy trail that goes north along the dark trail. And we need to finish the, the bike lanes around the city. And I think that's, we're going to become a much more, uh, I get on my bike all the time. Every Sunday morning I go down to see if the long, grass has been cut at the Dallas Morning News front yard. I just go down the Katy Trail and it's a it's a great little ride and I don't have to deal with big streets and you know, yeah. Thorough. I can testify to that because I think I talk to you after a lot of your bike rides too. That's right. We're on it. We're you on have it. your ideas about connectivity. Um, so Ray, you come and you check on the Dallas Morning News site. So let's talk about that. Why the Dallas Morning News site? 
after all this time and coming back and investing in downtown, why this site, why now, and what are your plans? Well, one is I'm a huge student of history, and I've always loved the front building, the George Dahl building, because it's actually the fifth George Dahl building that I've, that I've owned. And I didn't want to see it torn down. Uh, you know, I bought it for, to make money and economic reasons, but I really was afraid that someone will buy it and knock it over. And I watched it go through the HQ2 and a few of those other things. And finally, uh, when those things all played out, I looked at it and decided, you know, what Dallas really needed and what Dallas really lacks. I I'm on the ground in Dallas. Like I said, every Sunday morning, I'm on my bike all over downtown. You know, I call you when I'm down in Oak Cliff. I'm down around Fair Park. I, I think I've got a real on-the-ground feel for the city. And we don't have an entertainment district in this city. and Main Street is too far removed. Maybe that's from my days as a kid wandering around downtown, but the convention center is way too far removed from Main Street to serve really as the entertainment district. So when I was looking at the morning news, I jumped on a plane. I went to Nashville, Houston, Orlando, Vegas, and looked at their entertainment districts around their, shop, their uh, convention centers. And if you look at our convention center, when you walk out the front door, there is nothing to do, nowhere to go. And you got to walk to a cemetery in the front. You got blocks to go, and it's just nothing. So when I looked at a map, you know, I bought eight and a half acres, and it's sitting right up, hugged right up against the convention center. And I knew now pre-pandemic, I bought it over a year ago, but pre-pandemic, the uh, Omni was running a 70-plus percent occupancy rate, was doing fantastic. The Hyatt was doing great. The Omni is one of the smartest things the city ever did because it really – lifted the tide for every single hotel in downtown but even the omni you walk out the front door and it's like okay there's a huge disconnect between that and the rest of downtown dallas so my plan was to go in take the original doll building turn it into a the nothing we don't have downtown at that end of downtown is a cool hip boutique hotel everything's a big convention hotel the thousand room hotel so i got a hotel i commissioned a hotel study and he came back and said you need they desperately need a boutique hotel that would serve as that boutique customer that likes that type of thing. When I say boutique, um, be kind of on the order of the Jewel Hotel. Give a, a, mm -hmm. But, you know, the Jewel, again, is disconnected from the convention center. Is dropping something like the Jewel into that front building, take the old executive offices on the fourth floor, and turn that into a really cool club. Then on the back building, it used to be the production facility add some apartments so I can get some footfall. The street going between that and Channel 8 is a private street, but it really connects to the back of the convention center. I, I have 65 bars, restaurants in Dallas, from Me Casina to Katie Chill Ice House. To, I'm a partner in the Crew Wine Bars. I'm a partner in Rustic. So I got a good exposure to the hospitality of what's lacking in Dallas, I think. And that we could plug right into the convention center on the back end. But what the convention center still lacked, they needed another 1,000 to 1,500 rooms. So the back end of the site, we designed a 1,100-room hotel that would be something on the order of a, you know, Conrad Hilton or, a, you know, Omni-type or Hyatt-type, more a convention hotel that could connect right into the convention center, right into the back of the Omni. And then the convention center, we could expand across, across market and under market because, as you know, it's elevated up to where if you're at a convention, you could walk right out there and then I would – have it lined up with 10 to 12 restaurants, entertainment, bars. I was going to take the old room that had the uh, printing presses in it and the morning news. And for anyone on the call that used to work for the Dallas Morning News, I totally gutted the buildings out, including you ripped out the atrium that used to be between the first and the second floor. And it's incredibly cool space inside, but we brought back the room that the printing presses were in. So I'm going to do an entertainment facility in there, kind of like a Gillies or a uh, – uh, bomb factory for music and things like that. But if I'm next to the convention center, if you go to the you know, home builder convention, you literally can walk a few steps and you're in this cool, hip, retro 1940s feeling uh, entertainment district. And then the last thing, Courtney, on when I looked at the sixth floor on Saturdays, if you go down, just sit on the steps of the morning news, you see all these tourists. Walking down from the sixth floor to Union Station, they stop, they look around, they're bewildered, they don't know what to do or where to go, and they turn around and go back. I really want to make it as like a main street from the sixth floor through the convention center, so that is the 
natural walkway where people from the Hyatt will walk through, people from the Omni will flow through, the convention will flow to the West End, the West End will flow back. So Dallas downtown is really a east-west downtown street system. This will create a north-south-east, you know, the, the, really the first north-south connector that we've had. Yeah. Well, and it's like you know the questions that are coming because that's where I really want to, I want to talk about connectivity too because yeah. when, when we do have our evening and our weekend chats, we talk a lot about that for the entire city. But I know specifically something that has always, since we started talking a year and a half ago about your acquisition of the site, um, really understanding that that site can be a catalyst truly north, south, east, and west for connectivity. But look at how that site, particularly as you start to look at south side and the Cedars, and we've even talked some about the Oak Farm site and how that entire southwest corridor can really get turned on with what's happening over there right now. So talk a little bit more, get, get more in depth about that particular segment and what you're thinking. Well, Jack Matthews and I have had conversations. You know, he's got south side, as everybody knows, and he has all those parking lots kind of between the south side building and 45. He wants to do the railroad station, but that's on the other side in the old, uh, um, where the freezer buildings were, the offered refrigerated site. But if you look at a map and you get on the ground and you see it, there's a direct connection from south side all the way up to my site. I mean, at ground level. You'd have to cross 40, is it 45, 45 right there? No, 30. You'd have to cross 30 there, but that's not a complicated thing. And actually go through the edge of the convention center <clears throat> on the west side. If you were to do that, you could have a connected street all the way from the sixth floor down Houston, all the way through, and not on Lamar Street, but on the street behind Lamar. That's really right now just a small little two-lane alley, really, down the south side. Now, all of a sudden, you connect that into downtown north to south, okay? Not a complicated thing, not an expensive thing, and a totally doable concept, because you're not talking tons of infrastructure. Now you pivot to the Houston Street Viaduct. If, that's, if that could go to a kind of a high line type deal or a hike and bike trail type go along with the trolley, so that connects it over to the Oak Farm site. Now, when I had conversation with Oak Farms guys, they're trying to figure out what to do there, but that is an incredible site that is a mini city potentially right there. Now you got the connectivity across, now we got to gap the uh, Trinity in between, but any of you, I encourage any of you that like to bike ride, go down into the Trinity River bottoms. There are some unbelievable bike trails down there and the beauty down there and the nature and the, the Santa Fe trestle um, bridge they built just south of there is incredible. And no one in the United States has anything like this. And so, but it all has to be connected in behind the Longhorn Ballroom. And it's not, um, it's kind of the last frontier um, to do it. And the great thing is there are only really three landowners, myself, Matthews, and the Oak Farms guys, to put all this together as a great connected deal. Now, it's not going to be connected in the sense of a New York City or a Chicago or a San Francisco. We have density of towers on top of each other. And actually, since this pandemic, that's probably good. You know, we can have a spread out. And if you wanted a corporate campus at Oak Farms or on South Side, it's not 20 stories tall, but three stories wide, like they're doing at Legacy. You got all the land in the world down there to do something on. And again, it's owned in private ownership that has a, the financial backing to actually pull all this off. But it's got to be a vision to where everyone buys into not only the three of us, the landowners, but the whole city to say, okay, this, is trans this can transform everything for that area now, and bring everything into it. Housing, um, everyone talks about workforce housing and affordable housing. You have all that down there now. Now that gives those people a chance to plug in to the economic activity and the jobs that this thing would create. Right, well, and, and we've talked about that a lot and I, I appreciate your perspective because you mentioned corporate campus, but I know you always have a mind's eye on what we call in our planning, the complete neighborhood. Yeah. So when you think about those major district transformations, what do you think are the most valuable components? How do you create that, that right balance? 
for a, for a corporation to want to do a campus or, or housing jobs retail right. entertainment kind of all of the mixes that you're bringing into the dallas morning news site right yeah. but how how do you find that right balance how are you striking it well for first you got if you believe in the in the the an economy that's run by a flywheel, meaning the faster the flywheel goes, more and more things happen. And you're seeing that in, in Deep Elm right now, right? We've got the stack going up, the stack and on top of the Epic, and there's a lot of great activity happening down there. Well, it kind of, it's feeding on itself. You know, Uber actually does occupy those buildings and fill those things up. The East Quarter in Chantad is gonna benefit off that. So that area of town has kind of got the flywheel going. How do we get the flywheel going in our end of town, okay? I got to get the morning news deal started. You know, the city is um, put out this plan to have the convention center uh, redevelopment. Is that the RFP for the convention yeah. center? Yeah, redevelopment the convention center. The redevelop th that can't be lip service. They actually have got to pursue that and to its end. All right. And what I mean by that is if it truly, we just can't add another 300,000 square feet and think it's a day with a warehouse. The competition for the Dallas Convention Center is now the Arlington Convention. They're building an 800-room hotel and a big convention center next to the Globe Life Park. Fort Worth is building a brand-new downtown convention center. You know, before long, you're going to see Frisco and those guys wake up and want to do something out there. What do we create as a unique place for us to have? So to have these three big components and get this flywheel of activity started, the city – is really got to take what they've got with the convention center and say, okay, we're not going to talk about it and try to initiate something five or six years from now. We got to start now. There was a great lost opportunity with the Omni Hotel. That got so much activity going down there and excitement. It did so well. And then nothing has been built since. Zero. It just died. And so they should have taken that hotel and followed on it two years later with either another hotel or some other entertainment or, or something to keep now the activity just died out. So what I hope to do is start that activity with the convention, with my Dallas Morning News site by the boutique hotel. The big convention hotel is gonna, we're having to shelve that for now until we figure this pandemic. I am pushing ahead with the boutique in front. Um, we've already finished the demolition on it. I'm way down the road on my planning on, on that and then creating a small entertainment district. But I need to know the city's gonna be not my financial partner in it is my partner in the facility I already own with the convention center and turn it into best of class status because we're going to, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an arms race with Orlando. It used to be an arms race with Orlando, Las Vegas, Chicago. Now it's an arms race with Arlington, Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, Las Colinas, all the suburbs want what Dallas already has. So if I get that going, and Jack Matthews has got grand plans for his property. If he can get that going, that begins everyone else around there going, hey, I want to be part of this in some way, you know, in their own developments. You know, I need to get Ray Hunt to get something going at Reunion, you know, yeah. over there. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I think as we, we look at our recovery strategies, you know, you have, on one hand, we need to get it going, we need to get it going, and then I know we, we both have, the perspective that this is an opportunity. Yeah. Nowhere in another major American urban area do you have this much developable land. And particularly when you put it under consolidated ownership, which is a great mm -hmm. opportunity. So we're talking, Ray, like the last three months have not really even happened. Now let's, let's shift to reality. Obviously, we have had tremendous market impacts as a result of COVID-19. You're in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. You're in the development business. You're still talking about moving forward with a hotel. So talk a little bit about the impacts that you've seen just in terms of your companies uh, citywide, nationwide, um, and then how that's impacting any shifts that you're thinking for the Dallas Morning News development. Well, I'll give you an example. Katie Trail Ice House, the governor totally shut us down, 100%. I mean, so that sucks. <laughs> then, then, you know, Mikasina, we're at 50%. We've had to move so many of our seats out into the parking lots and the pop-ups that have the city, I think the cities have been good at being very uh, relaxed in the rules to en enable us to put re out there. But I mean, it's tough. No one wants to sit inside. And so um, we're trying to triage things along. A longer political debate is 
the PPP money that all the restaurants and people that are operating took, it's done. It's gone. It was spent on salaries in, you know, March, April, May, and part of June. So what happens next? There's incredible carnage in the restaurant business right now. I mean, you, you can just go drive around like Preston Center. I was telling you earlier, California Pizza Kitchen shut down for a lease sign in the window. You just go all over town and the next 45 days in the restaurant business is going to be horrific. You're, you're just not going to believe how many people are just not going to make it. So that's a big black cloud. Now, we get to the fall. It's, I don't know what to say. It's a, the ones that are over leveraged or who landlords aren't working with them aren't going to be able to pull out of it. Looking for my development stuff, like the doll building that I want to do boutique in, our plan was always to start construction first quarter of next year, and it's about a two-year construction time. I wasn't delivering to 23, 2023. The big building, we weren't going to deliver till 24, which now is the world back in three or four years. I don't know. The Great Depression won 11 years. I mean, but um, we're pushing ahead with the smaller building in front. It's only going to be 130-room boutique, and I think that there is a market for that in 2023. So – now, construction pricing, we thought we were going to see a big drop in it. We haven't. We've seen about a 5 or 6% drop. I thought I was going to see a 15 or 20%. Mm -hmm. And we think when we bid things out this fall, if more projects get shelved, we think subcontractors are going to get more aggressive on their pricing. And, you know, a lot of times the best time to build is in the worst times because you get the best pricing. So we're uh, pushing ahead with that. Our apartments, our downtown apartments, we have with streetlights, you know, they're you know, they're all in the 90s uh, occupied and the rent collection is good. So um, the th I'll give you the metrics on a project. For example, we built uh, the McKinsey, which is right behind Javier's. You know, it's a 20 story building that was built on hundred dollar land. And we built it for about, I think it was about 300 bucks a foot construction cost. Today, lands three to $400 a foot and construction costs is more like $400 a foot. So, I mean, you, you've got, you, you're just not able to, something's got to come back. And the land people aren't cutting their prices of their land. So, because they all think, like, I think the old Warsaw site sold for $400 a square foot. It's like, today, would that sell for $400 a foot? No. Is it, what's it worth? Maybe $100? Well, the guy I bought it for $400 is not selling it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, and I think that that begs another part of our conversation, which, you know, I'm, I think people know a lot about your developments, but maybe don't know as forward facing as you are with streetlights and the amount of multifamily that you've developed and as well as you've opened up with your other developments uh, in East Dallas. And I mean, you have a lot of multifamily experience and we've talked a lot about workforce housing on the Dallas Morning News site and how we know it's important for downtown. We know it's important for the city but you just outlined some of the challenges with land cost. Um, so I, I want to let everyone kind of hear your perspectives on the importance of diversity of housing and some of the challenges and hopefully some opportunities or solutions to be able to get there. I don't know if I have the solution. Right. <laughs> okay, the I mean, challenge. We'll start with the yeah, challenge. Fair. Well, the challenges are simple. Land costs are massive and Construction costs have shot out. The construction costs, but the other side is, is there demand? There's massive demand for it. But, you know, Jack Matthews built a project, I um, can't remember the name of it, just south of the convention center. And it's totally filled with people that work in the hotels and, and uh, that's the kind of workforce housing that happened. But, you know, does the city give incentives? The problem is the city gives you incentives and the city handcuffs you on what you can and can't do on things. So, um, we're trying to incorporate that in our property. I, I don't need any city help on my project other than just let us get it built <clears throat> and get out of the way and let permitting proceed the way other cities don't allow things to happen. Um, but it's going to have to be some kind of tax driven um, situation because you're not going to be able to do it without uh, unless land prices reel back. And, you know, land, I own a bunch of land in the Cedars that we sold last year for $25 a foot. But the only way, it, we couldn't pencil a deal out even at 25 bucks a foot on some land down in South Lamar. Just for normal 
housing because of the structured parking. The thing that might turn us around is if you got rid of parking requirements because a parking garage just you know, just crushes these deals. Yeah. Yeah, and actually that's that's one of the big recommendations coming out of our 360 plan that we've talked so much about is trying to uncouple those parking requirements. Um, so we have about eight minutes left, time flies. Um, I know we do have a couple of questions coming in um, from our audience. One's about opportunity zones. Yeah. Uh, that's on my list and I know you've got a lot of great perspective on that. So. Ray, I'm gonna go ahead and invite Shalissa to join us. And Shalissa, maybe start there, uh, because I think all of that in terms of talking about economics and recovery and why Ray bought the site and uh, how some other developments are moving forward, how Opportunity Zones play in. So Shalissa, welcome. Thank you, thank you guys very much. Um, yes, so our first question is from David at CBRE. Thanks for joining. Um, how important are Opportunity Zones in Dallas, Fort Worth, and does it really add value to the developer or investor as we move forward in this cycle? You know, that's a great question because when <clears throat> I originally looked at the site, it was pitched to us as Opportunity Zone. My project over in West Dallas is Opportunity Zone. But when you really get down to it, the real estate has to stand on its own. And if you look back throughout history in Tax Reform Act of in, back in the 80s, anything that is a tr tax-driven project ends up getting slacked in the end because you're driving it for the wrong reasons. You need to run it for its economic viability. So, and you have to hold it 10 years. So in the case of the Dallas Morning News site, hey, that's great to have that benefit down the road, but if the market says I should sell it in five years, that has done me no good. And if I wait 10 years, you present value your dollar invested, has it really made you any money? So, um, I like having it. It's a great added benefit, but we don't we don't factor into our analysis if we do a deal or we don't do a deal. It just happens to be, hey, at the end, it's gravy on a return at the end. But if you try to pencil a deal out with that as the driving force, and I think if you talk to people around the country, that's pretty much been the consensus of everyone. There was a land rush of excitement when this thing came out. And people bought, started developing stuff. And then it was like, well, wait a minute. We got to be sure this deal makes sense and not just go build. What happened in the 80s, like Danny Faulkner out in, you know, out at uh, uh, Lake Ray Hubbard, just built apartments because they were a tax-driven deal with a little corruption thrown in. But it was the, when you throw that into the equation, it just, you have a very difficult time to make it work in the end. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and what has changed, um, has anything changed at all about the way that the Opportunity Zones are working are we just kind of in a holding pattern or everything's moving forward as it was six months ago? Well, nothing's the same as it was six months ago. And that <laughs> pan I mean, investing, the, the, the fear of investors right now is the unknown. And like hotels, I'm looking at some hotels that are in severe distress. It's like, if you buy a hotel today, you got to look at it. You're not going to make any money for probably three years. And so that severely impacts the valuation of a hotel. So, What's happening now are foreclosures, but you haven't really seen the fire sales. And retail, obviously, you know, that's a, it's funny. I've got the barbell of the Highland Park Village at the highest rents in the city down to my center at, you know, Hampton and Singleton. You know, one of the lowest, probably the lowest end demographic of the city on both sides. And I've got great collections in both of them. Whereas I have some investments in some centers like in Plano, and it's horrible trying to collect from the tenants. So it's kind of like the smaller tenants we haven't had any issue with and the big tenants, we still have issues, but not like we do with the kind of the middle size one. So, mm -hmm. you know, the opportunity zone, I haven't heard anybody talk about, I haven't heard anybody do any acquisitions. They're all waiting for prices to drop and the guys that own it are praying that the market, you know, you all hear about this, the J curve, meaning thinking you know, the return's gonna be a hockey stick return. To, everything's back to normal, you know, this, this fall or this spring and, you know, uh, and buyers so, behind that. Right, right. It, it's, it's incredibly uncertain, which is, I think, again, what is so important about the conversation with you today and, and those that we're going to have throughout the summer, because you all are finding ways to continue to move forward in this uncertainty, uh, because I think you do see a light. If I can, I think, what did you tell me yesterday or the day before? 
You're a downtown optimist, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I am an optimist. And you know, the convention center is such the key thing. I mean, that's why I'm glad I'm on today. It's like, I hope somebody in the city is listening to this because it's like, you get the convention center going, that is the beginning of this flywheel to where my project thing gets going, Jack Matthews gets more going to Southside, you know, my code behind the convention and behind the Dow City Hall. Right now, it's, it's you, you can't look at where, the, where things are today. You gotta look at where do we want it to be in 22 or 23, 2022, 2023. That means we gotta get going today on stuff. We can't sit back and, and just woe is me. I saw woe is me in the 80s, as I told you earlier, when downtown died in the 80s, no one did anything about it. I mean, it just it, it just died. There, there was no – now we at least have some enthusiastic cheerleaders for downtown Dallas. For about – really, for about 15 years, it was, you know, crickets down there. Yeah, you're absolutely so, right. Shalissa, I think we have another yeah. question. Yeah, I think we probably have time for one more question, and it, it ties in nicely to what we were just talking about. Um, the question is, how about high-speed high rail station close to Southside? How does that tie into Ray's vision? Well, the Jack's plan is to have it just south of the freeway, and, you know, we have to get the intermodal, which the city is planning on doing on the, on the uh, southwest corner of the convention center. All that needs to be tied together. And so that vision for that whole kind of southeast, quad, southwest quadrant, uh, when, when you take Oak Farms, Longhorn Ballroom area, you know, all that, it all ties together. But, you know, when is it going to be built? <laughs> What's it going to look like in all those things? I mean, I've seen plans for it to come in with an Uber heliport there that you can then take up to Legacy and an Uber helicopter in, you know, 10 minutes or to Fort Worth. And, well, that's all great. That didn't do anything for downtown. That just lifts the people out of there. So, you know, we got to create a neighborhood around that station that makes it feel like it's a, it's a true uh, live, work, play area and not just something that you're transitioning through to go somewhere else. Yeah. I uh, was right at a couple of the things that you said, I think really sum up a few of these points really well. Um, Shalissa, are there any more questions? I think we may be able to take one more and then I'll, I'll start closing this out. Sure, sure. Um, one more, um, which I think Courtney could probably answer based on some of our 360 plan. Um, our downtown streets are designed for 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. to get traffic in and out. How do we get them on a diet and get sidewalks wider uh, with trees, dining opportunities, patios, and the like, bike lanes for scooters and bikes as well. Yeah, well look, king, king for a day. <laughs> um, the streets all need to be two way downtown. I mean, I look in front of the morning news site and I got Young Street going one way and the other, and it's confusing to a lot of people. And I, I don't know why, I'm sure there's a good explanation. I have no idea why every street downtown Dallas is two way. Um, I know the traffic engineers in the past wanted to get people out of downtown or into downtown, into their office tower. And that was, that was very poor 1970s and 1980s planning. And as I started the conversation off in the 1960s, they were all two-way streets and there was incredible street life. That they didn't have the tunnel system then. And it was incredibly vibrant. And I think the vibrancy of the city will come back to choke down streets with lots of outdoor dining and, and, you, you know, activity on the street. So um, make me king for a day and we can make things happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I love it. And I do think, you know, that is coming absolutely full circle in so much of our planning as we focus now on public transportation, on restarting streetcar conversations, on priority on walkability and now bikeability. Um, so much of that does come full circle to the visions that you were drawing from childhood. And I do have to say that at least as of a few months ago, there was still a popcorn stand in the basement of the Davis building in the tunnels. So is that right? All right. Well, <laughs> you can go back and see that. Um, yeah. Ray, thank you so much for spending this time this morning. I, I'm so grateful for it. I think your thoughts, your perspective, your vision of connectivity is so important for downtown. I think the diversity in your investments across the city is so key to how we all move forward. And your dedication and love for Dallas and love of historic preservation are just absolutely, I think, what is, is what gives us all that, that downtown optimist type of perspective on how we're going to move forward. So 
Thank you so much for your time. For everyone else, please be sure and join us again on July 16th. We will have Sean Todd with Todd Investments. Sean is the developer behind the East Quarter as well as the National. Those are the two under construction right now. And we know Sean's development well from the old post office building downtown uh, as well as One Dallas Center. So a lot of history, a lot of expertise there. Then we'll have Larry Daniels with HRI talking about hospitality on July 30th and Mike Hoke to follow on August 17th with Hope Global. So be sure and join us throughout the summer. We'll be adding more speakers to this list, but go ahead and save the dates for those that we have posted right there for you today. I do have to also take this opportunity. Some of you are Downtown Dallas Inc. members and some of you are not. And we know the realities of today, but it is as a nonprofit something that's very important to us to help to continue to deliver the type of services that we do. So if you're interested in joining, if you're interested in being a part of the civic engagement that this organization leads, please reach out to us. All of our contact information is on our website at downtowndallas.com, and you'll also find basic information about joining our organization there. You can also sign up for our emails to make sure that you're staying in tune with the latest and greatest news. This will give you access to everything from information on what's happening with different regulation changes on up to what restaurants are open and closed, as well as all the market information that you would ever need about downtown kept up to date. Um, you can hear someone knocking on the door in the office right now. <laughs> the little glitches in these uh, virtual forums. Um, also on our website, be sure we have our COVID-19 resource page. So that is where you will find information if you are a resident looking for rental assistance, if you are a business looking for guidance or assistance on any of the federal, state, or local programs that help our small businesses. And finally, our State of Downtown report. If you weren't able to join us for the kickoff of this series last week, our State of Downtown report is posted on the website and we are updating that monthly now. So you can get the latest numbers knowing what businesses are open, what businesses are closed, as well as how the market is performing in all of our industry sectors so that you all can better plan how you're moving your businesses forward. Again, thank you, Ray. It's been great talking to you this morning. Um, and we look forward to seeing what comes next with your project. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing? No, no, I just, you're doing a great job, Courtney. And, and you know, the other stakeholders downtown like Tim Heddington and you mentioned Sean Todd. I mean, we're all trying to, you know, put all this in our shoulders and lift it. So you've got a dedicated group of, I, I just listening to the people you have coming on, it's, you know, we're, we're there and you're doing a great job. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. We will continue to find opportunities and the challenges that are before us. And we look forward with working with all of you who are on this session today. And again, be sure and join us next week, July 16th. Thank you and have a great day.